So we got to share with the employees. Because without employees, we can't make a profit. And if employees make more money, they have more purchasing power. The economy functions better. But we must open up. We must. It's it's so crucial that small enterprise that we don't tie them up in chains and with regulations. Hello, everyone watching and listening. Today, I have the honor to speak with Frank Stronach, founder and CEO of Magna International, one of Canada and the world's great companies. Um, Frank built that company from nothing starting in the 1950s. It's quite a story. We discuss the keys to motivating yourself to starting and maintaining a successful and expanding business, why that's a good thing for yourself and everybody else. The idea contained within, within his corporate constitution. It's an economic charter of rights, which advocates for the input, autonomy, and profit sharing uh, among all, all workers, management, um, shareholders, etc. And I'm very much looking forward to talking about it with him. Hello, Mr. Stronach. It's very, very nice to see you. Um, we met a couple of months ago at a restaurant in Toronto, and I had the opportunity to talk to you about your business ventures over the last five or six decades, um, which I found extraordinarily interesting. And in the intervening period of time, I've read your, I've read one of your books, uh, the one that's more autobiographical. Um, and um, I'm very interested in your story. I thought you would make a particularly good podcast guest because one of the things I do with my podcast is walk people through the lives of successful individuals, because I think it would be better if people believed that they could move forward successfully in the world and that they were equipped with some knowledge about how to do that. And I think that's something we could really concentrate on, focusing in on. I know it's very important to you. In this podcast, you came to Canada in the 1950s, we'll, we'll go through your story autobiographically, you came armed with a tiny bit of money, some actual skill, some determination, and out of that, you built a massive business empire. Let's start, let's start with this. Not everyone listening and watching are, are going to know what Magna Enterprises is. So would you do us the favor first of laying out your business empire Tell people what it is that you do and what you've accomplished, how you're spread out through the world, what you guys manufacture. Just lay out the story, the, the description of Magna. Okay, I've always said life is a question of fate and circumstances. Being at the right places at the right time with the right ingredients. As it happened, uh, I was born in a working class family. And when I finished my schooling and I had one or two years practical experience, I wanted to see the world. I applied for a visa to South Africa, Australia, the United States, and Canada. Sometimes I'm a little tough on the Canadian bureaucracy, but I'm saying it's still the best because they came first forward with a visa. So I landed in Quebec City. I took the cheapest fare I could, uh, you know, from Holland on a coal freighter. And uh, uh, so I arrived in Quebec in, I think it was about April uh, 1954, and uh, the immigration officer asked me, do you know anybody in Canada? I said, no. So I said, well, then you go to Montreal. So I moved to, so I took a train to Montreal, uh, uh, and, but I didn't know anybody. My English was reasonable okay, and I, there were some uh, English speaking people on that ship, and so I tried to practice my English. So anyway, I knew because I had $200 in my pocket, and I knew that wouldn't last me too long if it would, if I would uh, right away, uh, 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 bought a hotel or whatever. And so, uh, so the people told me, look, just walk along the streets and it's customary. If you see a sign, room to let, just knock on the door and, and, and you might get a room. So 
I did work for um, uh, an hour or two, right? I, I knocked on the door. Where a few signs I've seen, I knocked on the door. I think I kind of looked a little rough from uh, the long uh, journey, and uh, so they say it's already leased. But I did find I did find the room. So the next morning I got up and uh, and uh, I looked at the road maps, I looked at the, and walked around, and I worked in the factory, but it was in 54, there was a, a major recession, I just couldn't find a job, right? And um, during that time, I was hungry, hungry not because I wanted to lose weight, I was hungry, I had no money to buy food. And if you experience that, that's a, yeah, that's a, a, an impression which will last forever. It's burnt in your soul, right? So anyway, I ran out of money. I was hungry. I, I had an acquaintance, not a close friend, but somebody I you know from the same town I came from. And uh, that was in Kitchener, right? So I saved enough money to do. I bought a Greyhound bus ticket and uh, and I moved to Kitchener. I traveled by bus by Kitchener from Montreal. And uh, so when I got off, off the main square, I asked somebody where such and such address is. They said, look, go up there four blocks and then uh, ask again. And so up four blocks, ask you, well, uh, go up three more blocks and then you might have to make a left turn. So I, again, I, I, after about two hours of walking, I could find the house where that fella uh, left and I knocked on the door and uh, an elderly lady said, uh, Max, that was the fella's name, uh, there's somebody here who wanted to see me. I was very, uh, it was a very happy feeling, you know, to meet somebody uh, which you know from previous days. So anyway, uh, Max came down and he looked at me and said, you, can, you look a little rough. Are you hungry? I said, yes, come on in. So uh, the next day I slept there. The next day we started job hunting. Uh, uh, in, in the industrial site there was nothing, but I did find a job at the kitchen of Waterloo Hospital in the kitchen. And uh, so I, I felt so sorry for myself. I feel when I come to Canada, I get a manly job, you know, t cutting trees down or taking out stones, something manly. But I was there in the kitchen with a lot of elderly women, nothing against elderly women. My mother was an elderly woman. I liked her, but I felt sorry for myself to peeling potatoes, washing salads, et cetera, et cetera. So in the evening, it was just itching to get away to me amongst people. In those days, there were there was an Austrian club in Kitchener. So I went there. In those days, there was slow dancing, right? A lot of music. And when I danced with a girl, you know, uh, you know what you do, where you're from. I say, I'm from Austria. What you do? Well, I work in a hospital. My hands were so smooth from washing dishes. They thought I was a surgeon. So, but that was the end. They always kind of said, no, I'm just working in the kitchen. Then I did, they, I guess they didn't want to dance close. They didn't want to go out with a guy which works in the kitchen, but that's the way life is. But anyway, after a little while, uh, I, I, after about a month or so, I did find a, a job in an engineering and a production oriented company. They, uh, the company uh, worked exclusive, exclusively for the Avro Aero aircraft. Right, which uh, uh, which uh, Canada developed, and uh, and but that um, that project was uh, wasn't financed anymore, and it was it uh, it it was closed. The factory, the Avro aircraft factory, I think, was closed. The company I worked for was closed, so I. I had checked a right to, from Kitchener to, to Oakville. Fort was building a, a new factory at the time there. There were huge lineups. I waited up out for about two, three hours before they interviewed me and they interviewed, looked, um, yes, you're dual and time maker. You're too young to get any, any experiences. So I wasn't hired and uh, I drifted to, uh, to Toronto and I had checked a right to Toronto. 
But uh, years later, I had uh, had uh, many times, uh, you know, a meeting, a lunch meeting, dinner meeting with the president of Ford. And I told me, you're lucky. If I got hired at the time, I would be the president, right? So I, I, I could tease him, right? I, I knew him well enough that I could. Tease. But anyway, I did find a job then, a very small company, you know, about 10 people. After a year, after a few months, uh, the guy said, the owner said, you're doing a great job. I want you to be a partner of mine. And uh, and uh, my chest swelled a little, and that's great. And uh, nice guy, but he'd never wrote it down, what it's all about. So I I said to myself, there's nothing to do with the run of factory. So I looked in the papers, and I, I found the job. I got paid a lot more. I moved in a rooming house where the toilets were in the hallway and I saved every dollar. After after a couple of years, I saved about $5,000. I rented a garage. Uh, actually, it was the gatehouse of Standard Products in Dufferin and Dupont in Toronto. And I, um, the size was about maybe double the, uh, than the garage. I bought a few used machines. I had a $5,000 saved up because in terms today, that would be at least a hundred or 150,000, right? So I bought the used machines and out I went hustling and knocked on, on factory doors. And I said, I'm, a, I'm great in solving problems. And I said, look, if I can't solve the problems, you don't have to pay me. But anyway, after one month, I hired a worker. After a year, I had about 10 workers. After two years, about 20. After five years, about three, 4,000. After 10 years, about 75,000. After 20 years, 125,000. And then uh, I built up a company with 170,000 employees in 34 different countries. So anyway, the message I want to get across is, you know, when we're younger, we all hustle to make some monies so that we can live in dignity. I guess I could have lived in dignity in all those 34 countries, but I chose Canada. I think uh, I... I I've seen the world and I met just about every president, uh, you know, from uh, from Clinton to Putin to Tony Blair, just about everybody. And I could see Canada perhaps the only country now which could be a role model, which where we could, uh, where we could implement an economic charter of rights. Magna basically is more than a business. It's really a culture. I call it the fair enterprise system. The basic philosophy on fair enterprise is the human charter of rights alone is not sufficient. We have to fortify it with an economic charter of rights. Economic charters of rights relate to economic democracies and economic democracies are the basis for democracy itself. But let me explain it a little better because uh, we uh, we don't talk too much about it, you know. Uh, those uh, those conversations are not uh, they're not plentiful, right? But um, uh, let me simplify things now. All the politicians, all business, all what matter of fact, most people agree: if the economy doesn't work, nothing else will work. You cannot feed the hungry. You cannot look after the most fragile people, the elderly, the sick, and the handicapped. But we do not talk what drives the economy. The economy is driven by three forces. Smart managers, hardworking employees, and investors. That means all three have a right to the outcome, which is profits. The message I want to get across is if we fail or if we do not let workers participate in profits, then we got a problem, okay? Because the world has always been dominated by the golden rule and still is. The people which have the gold make the rules. I don't want to be dominated by anyone if I feel that strong 
then I should not be able to dominate somebody either. So thereby, uh, the only way we be able to achieve that is why an economic charter of rights. The message I want to get across to Canadians is the human charter of rights alone is not sufficient. We have to fortify it with an economic charter of rights. Economic charter of rights, as I said before, will lead to economic democracies. And economic democracies are the basis for democracy itself. The human charter of rights alone doesn't mean a lot of things for a kid in inner city Detroit is free to be hungry. So the amazing story about the whole thing is when I put in a corporate constitution at Magni, it was about in the mid-late 80s, the constitution basically said, or, or the, the most important thing on the, on the constitution was, we predetermined what we do with the profits. So the, the constitution said, the, uh, the profit sharing said, 20% of the profits go to the shareholders, 10% goes to the employees over and above their wages, half in shares, half in cash. 6% management gets, 2% charity gets, and 7% is reinvested for, uh, for research. So when I put the constitution in, the profits went up the first year about 40%. The second year, about 100%. The third year, about 200%. When you empower employees where they share, where, they, where there's a clear-cut concept, where they share in the profits, you release an enormous energy. You know, because they're on the front line. The employees are on the front line. They can see what you have to do to make a better product for a better price. So that's what it's all about. That's the kind of can, that's what the world needs. You know, we stand uh, perhaps at, um, at a crossroad. Who will dominate the world? The United States is slipping to a certain extent. The United States has dominated the world for the last hundred years. And we have freedom and uh, religious freedom, freedom to speak and a lot of freedom. Uh, great, right? Uh, we have maybe followed it up and we could do a little better there. But the United States, uh, unfortunately, has a lot of problems. There's cancer in the inner cities. The poverty is enormous. I don't know if it's feasible, right? But the very, the, the, the very, the key question we have to ask ourselves, what can we do to, uh, you know, because the divide is too great. There's so much money held by just a few. And there's so much poverty by many. Okay. So what do we have to do to, to, um, to level that out, not completely. You, you can never, you should never level it out. At the same time, I say, a country which stifles its citizen in pursuit of productivity, ingenuity, creativity is a decaying this, a society because you have uh, the society or the world's made up of different minds, different desires, different. Let everybody choose their own road to happiness. Okay, so, but it's very important. So I divide, I divide actually the program. I classify business over 300 employees. It's, it's a large business. Below 300 people, it's a small business. The law would stipulate that the, the large business, which have more than 300 employees, that they, the law would provide that workers could share in some of the profits. And that could be determined, right? It could be an escalated program. The small business, uh, small business basically is the backbone of any country. This, they pay the most taxes, they have the most employment, and this is where, call it, the new products come forward, the new technology, etc. So we must do everything we can 
That's what that do. We take the red tapes off, take the chains of small business and let small, small business operate under the pure free enterprise principles. So there is the bureaucracy has climbed enormously. You know, I could never build a magnet anymore. Imagine starting out in a garage. Imagine to build 170,000 employees, over 400 factories worldwide. I could never because I would choke under the first factory, right? And I could give you examples now how, how cumbersome it is, right? Okay. And when we look back 40, 50 years, yes, we have a lot of security, uh, uh, our safety measurement and, uh, you know, uh, buildings have to be built that then will collapse over the snow load, et, et cetera. But the bureaucracy has climbed to such an extent. But let me, I, I'd like to point out, I, uh, to bring up a change, you won't bring up a change if you point the fingers whose fault it is. And you cannot do it with the change so either. So I'm saying it's not the fault of the, bureau, of the bureaucrats. In a free society, everybody has a right to find a job, whatever the job openings are. It's the system, the system we have to change. Our politicians are trapped in the systems because the politics is whoever brings forward something new, any politician or party, they won't win because you could criticize them. So this is the problem. Uh, politics, government can't fix things. So it needs, it's, it needs a private citizen. It needs a coalition of what I would call concerned Canadians, which where you could leave the program relative short that you could combine. This is what we need to get the economy going. Because the economy, you know, uh, I, I think it's it's frightening what will happen over the next five, ten years. We don't make things anymore. When you look, when you see factories, the factories are all warehouses. We don't make things. And when a country doesn't make things, they got to import everything. Then is where the, the economy breaks down and where, where, where there's no jobs, where people go hungry. So we got to avoid that. So I think I've given you uh, a bit of a short overview, and uh, I would be very happy to now uh, to answer questions and uh, and uh, uh, how can we how can we fix things? Okay, so I would like to know first of all what skills you brought to Canada with you, and how long it took you to acquire those skills, say on the tool and die maker side. And then also, what attitude you think you brought to bear to your work that enticed the first person, for example, to offer you a partnership, but that also made you capable of taking the risk and developing the vision to rent that first empty garage? So how were you trained? How long did that take? What made you a good potential partner? And why did you have enough daring, let's say, or vision to rent that first garage? Well, the training, uh, I I served high school. Uh, high school, uh, it was only eight classes. And I proposed to, in Canada, we should, uh, high school should end at grade 10, grade 11, at grade 12, we should, uh, uh, students should focus, we should teach them trades. And that doesn't mean that the students after grade 12 couldn't go to university. I'm just now uh, telling people uh, the situation I was exposed to. So it was a three and a half year program. We had one or two days where we had theoretical stuff where we had to be in classrooms. And uh, let's say four days we were on the, on the, in the workshop on the floor learning different things. So that was the program. What did you learn? What what, we, what skills did you acquire? It uh, tool making is sort of for every. You need to, uh, let's say uh, let's take this pen here. That's not made by hand. Huh? 
it does so much precision, so much knowledge goes in a in a in a in a writing band. The, the ink's gotta come out for the next few months. It's such a minute that just that you can read and write. So uh, you gotta make machines or tools or or let's. People might may understand. Well, let's say a bumper for a car is not made by hand, huh? Okay, you need a mold because it's plastic, right? And it's uh, you, you. So this is what tool making is about, right? And this is um, this is maybe the most important trade uh, to. Uh, to get things done, to get things made, right? When you take a, when you take a car, might it be a door, might it be a seat, might it be the bumper, right? You need tools, you need dies, and then special machinery. So that will, uh, call it the basics, would take three to four years, and then it might take another few years till you slowly work yourself up that you'd be a qualified tool and die maker. We're facing the threat of a government shutdown later this month. And yet again, the administration will ultimately deal with it the same way they always do, with more spending. More spending equals a lower value of the dollar. Protect your savings by diversifying into gold with the help of the Birch Gold Group. And here's the best part. When you open a gold IRA with Birch Gold, for every $10,000 you spend by December 22nd, Birch Gold will send you a free gold bar. Just text Jordan to 989898 to claim eligibility before Black Friday. Birch Gold can even help you convert an existing IRA or 401k into an IRA in gold for no money out of pocket, and you still get the free gold bars. With an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau and thousands of satisfied customers, you can count on Birch Gold to help you navigate transitioning an existing IRA or 401k into an IRA in gold. Don't let your savings become a victim of the further devaluation of the dollar through more spending. Text Jordan to 989898. And so what machines did you learn to operate when you were doing your training? And you also mentioned earlier that you were confident in putting yourself forward as a good problem solver. And so what was the relationship between learning those machines? When, what machines did you learn? And how did that facilitate your development as a problem solver? Interesting. The first, when I came out of high school, my first day at that factory, you know, I needed a platform because I couldn't quite reach up, right? I was 14 years of age. I couldn't reach up. There was a vice grip mounted on the thing here. And then there was a piece of steel. The piece of steel was about four inches square. Okay. We, uh, we took two people to lift that steel up on, on the vice grip. And then we had a, then we had a, a hacksaw, a metal hacksaw. We had to cut the piece down four inches square. And that took, uh, that took maybe a week. Okay till we cut the thing down. And then it took maybe about three, four weeks. We had to file it perfectly square. So that, I mean, it's amazing thing what that leads to and how you accumulate the precision work, right? I did a similar school in Canada where we, where we, we had a school here to teach young kids how to be drill and die makers, right? But anyway, so you go and then we learn, uh, we learn things on a lathe where you make round things or a milling machine and later on, uh, precision, uh, computerized machines, et cetera, et cetera. So you go to a stage, right? Okay. So anyway, that's what we, uh, I did, uh, my first job then in Toronto as a tool and die maker. We made a stamping die, right? We did to maybe punch out a piece of metal and, uh, with some holes in it. And uh, so that's basically, uh, what a tool and die maker does. And as, as you go along, it gets more and more sophisticated. Right, right. So you got, you got familiarized with, a wide variety of tools and the ability to make precision parts. Now, you said you also became a good problem solver, and then you also developed this idea that you could rent your own garage and start producing your own tools. Now, one of the things you said was that when you went out to sell your services, 
you told your potential customers that you could solve a problem, and if you didn't, they didn't have to pay you. And you know, the reason I want to focus on that in part is because I want to know how you developed the vision to rent that garage to begin with, but also how you knew that the proper thing to sell to potential customers was your service as a problem solver, right? Because what you're saying to them essentially is, well, you guys have a problem and it's plaguing you and you need it solved and I'm the guy that can solve it and I'm willing to you know, demonstrate my capabilities, which is, which is really an excellent approach to sales because you wanna find out what the person's problem is and you wanna be the solution. But how did you develop that problem solving ability and your confidence in it? And then why did you think it was worth taking the risk to rent that first garage? Jordan, you ask great questions. I mean, those have to be answered. The reason why I'm sitting here is, look, I want to roll off the experience I accumulated. There's thousands and thousands and thousands of young Canadians out there which could do the same thing if we if we teach them the basics, right? And I, I think a society would be much better off with thousands of smaller companies than one or two large companies, right? That's what uh, that's that's the idea. So anyway. So I opened up that factory. I, I could solve a few problems. I got some orders. And I, 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 like I said, after two years, I had about 20 people. And I noticed my foreman was a little different, right? Because when he had just got, you work so closely together. His name was Herman. I said, Herman, what's the matter with you lately? Well, he said, Frank, I'm thinking of opening my own factory. Hmm. I said, I sympathize with that. I, that's what I did too. I said, look, why don't we talk tomorrow? Maybe we can find a better solution. That evening I was talking to myself and I said to myself, if that foreman's going to leave me, that would stifle my growth. I didn't like that. The next reason was if that foreman's going to leave me, I got to do all the work myself. I like that if less. The third reason was if I hire a new foreman and I don't show him how to how to run the business, I still got it all the work. And I, if I hire a new foreman and I show him how business is run, it's just a question of time before he goes out and opens up his new factory. I, I think the key is we need we we need those experience. There is. There is this huge potential, right? This huge energy, which lies dormant in people. We have to teach them the right way. So I think it's important while I'm still, I uh, have everything in my mind quite clearly that we record that. And it's great that you, your skill is to, to ask the right question. How come and how what? Right. Okay. So I'm, I'm delighted to sit here. Well, so you, you grew very rapidly. So, so there's two mysteries there to me because one of the things I've noticed with small businesses, for example, is that it's very difficult to get your first customers, right? It's very difficult to get from zero to one. Once you have a customer or two, the next customers start to be easier because you can refer them to other customers you have. But getting those first people to decide that you're the person when no one else has done it or has, has, has been willing to show that faith, that can be very tricky. So, what do you think you managed successfully to, how do you think you managed to present yourself successfully to the first people that you offered your services to? Well, it's price and quality, does it function, right? And if you have a lot of knowledge and you, and you transmit that knowledge to other people, then you, then you can give a great service better pricing, uh, better functioning machinery, better tools. So that's the very key, and that's what I would like to transmit. So uh, fortunately, um, around that time, that's why I'm always saying life is a question of fate and circumstances, being at the right place at the right time. Around the, in, uh, in the early 60s, uh, you know, there was a free trade arrangement uh, signed with the United States. And, uh, and I see this huge potential out there. 
I should say I didn't finish up when I talked the next day with my foreman, where, where I said, I said to him, look, why don't we open up a new factory? You own a third. And I said, no more overtime. I own two thirds. And by, by the end of the year, we take pro rata some monies out and we leave some monies in for expansions. He said, do you mean it? I said, yes. We went right away to a lawyer and signed the thing here. And the guy hustled like crazy. You know, he spent more time in there. That was his factory. Basically, I took the next form and the next form and the next form and the next form. I said, business is easy, right? And then uh, when I had about, I think it was about uh, six or seven factories, and uh, the free trade arrangement uh, came under the being. I saw this enormous potential up there. Up to that now, I only shared with the foreman. I said, if I, and then I got to know uh, the United States better, Canada better, the, the power of the unions, the size of the unions. And I said, if I, if I, uh, I would have to do certain things to be competitive. So uh, I uh, I had a friend of mine, a machinery dealer, and he said, to, I, I kind of explained to him, I really should go public because I want to have the workers also participate. Well, he says, I know a, I know a fellow, which his name is, uh, it'll, it'll, I'll remember the name, it's, it's in my deal, but anyway, he gave me the name. I, I met him uh, at the ski hill. Uh, we went skiing to get up at, uh, at Church Beaks, and uh, he said, look, have a, uh, that was Magna Electronics, okay? He said, I have a certain age, I would like to retire. Why do you, why don't you sell your companies in, 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 in Magna Electronics and, and you have close to control and then you could put that program in that where we also, where you can share the profits with workers. So that's what I find that it, that I was totally green when it comes down to public company, right? Uh, I did not have total control. I had a board there, right? And they were more in, uh, in driving the stock up, right? And, and uh, the, def the, the defense industry was very, uh, they were mainly, Magnet Electronic did mainly defense work, right? And that was very popular. And I was an automotive and I said, uh, after a year or so, I said, uh, I don't think this makes a lot of, I said, um, I, 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 I want to be out. Okay. And I said, I sell my stock on, uh, on, on, the, on the market. So they pleaded with me, please sell the stock to us. And I said, fine, no problem. And, uh, give us a year time. And I said, fine. They were basically okay, guys. But the market kind of went down, uh, the share step, they didn't have the monies. I never sued anybody and I just said, look, under the circumstances, you guys can't be on the board. And then I put in different directors and after a while I went to the, to the board and went to the public and I say, I, for, I, I, I forgo about, uh, 25% of my stocks if you, the shareholders, vote for a multiple vote. Because I came to the conclusion, I want to run things and I can't have 20 guys or 50 guys left and right d d discussing, debating forever, right? So uh, I, um, I, the shareholders voted for that. Then I said, I, in the return, I also give you a, thing, a certain discipline. This is where I put the corporate constitution in, that if I had control, I only could take out so much. There was uh, clear-cut control what management uh, could do. And that sort of uh, became the, the magna, the, the magna environment. Okay. But the yeah. Well, let's go back to your foreman. So you had said that when you made that arrangement with him, that you valued his work and you wanted him around, and you were concerned that if he left, well, all of that work would fall on your shoulders again and also stop you from moving ahead. And you sat down and contemplated what sort of deal you would have to make with him 
in order for his needs to be met and yours. And there's something very important there about the nature of a deal. You know, people often think that with a deal, you try to win or with a deal, you try to compromise. But my sense with a proper negotiation is that you want to figure out what you want so that you're thrilled to progress with the deal. And you want to figure out what your partner wants so he's thrilled to progress with the deal. Because if you set it up that way, then your interests are aligned and you're both going to work as hard as you can autonomously. Now, you knew your foreman had the same kind of entrepreneurial vision you did and you wanted to unleash his abilities. And so you offered him a third of the company. You said you'd take two thirds. And then you said he was thrilled, which is a good thing to have happen in a partner. And he went off and like treated this factory like it was his own, partly because it was. Now, and then you said you you duplicated that subsidiary structure across six factories and then expanded much more dramatically. And you also, at that point, also noted that that principle of distributed ownership should be brought down to the workers. So you were starting to develop that as an explicit philosophy. Now, why, why do you think it was that you realized that your foreman needed ownership? Why do you think you were willing to grant it to him? And why do you think that the agreement that you made, which was that you would own one third of the, or that he would own one third of the company and you would own two thirds, why do you think that was a desirable and, and uh, a compelling motivational arrangement for your foreman? First of all, a deal, you gotta be a deal for both sides. It's gotta be good, right? And as a company grows, circumstances might change a bit, et cetera, et cetera. So you make provisions if you can. The reason why I think he, he was delighted with the deal is, uh, when we had uh, verbal arrangements, I never went back on my word. I think that's a very key, right? So he felt comfortable when they say, we take out a third, right? Uh, we, we take out a portion in a, a pro rata. So he felt kind of comfortable, right? That I, uh, that I, uh, that's, that's very crucial. Like later on, if I, if, you know, once when they had about 30, or 40, or 50, or 100 factories, and I had a prospective uh, manager, which I interviewed. I said, look, there's, there's the name, the addresses of a hundred factories. Pick whoever manager you want to, want to choose and, and, and ask him how I run things. Okay. The message what I wanted to get across, if you promise something, you must keep it. Doesn't matter what the thing is, because you, if you got the ability, you can always make monies. If you lose your reputation, you can never repair it. So I think I had a reputation built up. And again, when I said uh, small companies, you don't need a, you, you don't need a formal structure. It's kind of loose. It's pure free enterprise. Like when I was small, when I had about 20, 30, 40 workers, I showed him my bank book and said, look, this is a contract we have here. If we do X, X, I can share it with you, right? So you don't, it's pure free enterprise. And that's what I want to get across. That's pure capitalism. But capitalism, if we don't change, if we do not look like workers participate, capitalistic, uh, the system is self-destructive. And let me give you a quick story, right? Uh, I spent a lot of time in Washington. At one time, I had a meeting with the leader of the house, Mitch McConnell. He's the senator from Kentucky, was the president of the Senate. I had a farm in Kentucky, so I knew him. So I said, Mitch, let's, uh, you know, I'd I like to see you one of those days. So we arranged, I met him, and I said, Mitch, America did great way at the free enterprise system. And without free enterprise, there's no free society. So we must do everything we can to have free enterprise. But I said, free enterprise got a major problem. So he said, what do you mean by that? I said, Mitch, more and more capitalists help by fewer and fewer. 
And I said, I said, in nature, when a species does not reproduce itself, another species will take over. And the laws of nature are much stronger than any man-made law, right? And that's what happens now. That's the way we're going to go. So we got to share with the employees. Because without employees, we can't make a profit. And if employees make more money, they have more purchasing power. The economy functions better. Okay, so we must, we must have the large companies, they must have more of a discipline because they sometimes they run by institutions, by, by, and they have got no more affinity for people that they just look at the share price, they look at the profits, so it's not there, right? So, uh, the owners are not there anymore, or, uh, so anyway, we need a discipline there, but, but we must open up. We must. It's it's so crucial that small enterprise that we don't tie them up in chains and with regulations. The Bible is the root of all wisdom, inspiration, and spiritual nourishment. The Hallow app empowers you to explore the Bible's profound teachings and to effortlessly incorporate them into your daily life. A great place to start while you deepen your understanding of the Bible is to check out Father Mike Schmitz's Bible in a Year available on the Hallow app for brief daily readings and reflections. Here you can dive into an extensive library of Bible reading plans, accompanied by insightful reflections and audio-guided meditations. Whether you're a seasoned Bible reader or just starting your journey, Hallow provides a platform for you to engage with Scripture like never before. Studying the Bible's literary brilliance has influenced countless writers, poets, and artists throughout history. By studying the Bible yourself, you'll gain a deeper appreciation for the power of storytelling, symbolism, and metaphor, enriching your understanding of literature across different genres. The Hallow app also helps you connect with a community of like-minded individuals, sharing experiences, insights, and encouragement along the path to spiritual growth. Download the app for free at hallow.com Jordan. You can set reminders and track your progress along the way. Enrich your education and nurture your mind and soul today. Download the Hallow app at hallow.com Jordan. That's hallow.com slash Jordan. Hallow.com slash Jordan for an exclusive three-month free trial of all 10,000 plus prayers and meditations. Okay, now you highlighted, you highlighted three things, you know. The first thing you highlighted was that the people that you were negotiating could trust you. Now, people who are cynically um, critical of capitalism tend to justify that by noting the sort of winner-take-all problem that you described. And then they presume that if you're greedy and you shovel everything towards yourself, you're most likely to, let's say, win in the capitalist enterprise. But you pointed out something very much contrary to that, three things, actually. The first is that you don't develop a reputation by screwing other people. You develop a reputation by telling other people what you're going to do and then bloody well doing it. And that you should also write down what you say you're going to do so that everybody remembers and knows exactly what the deal is. That you said that by the time you were negotiating, let's say with a foreman who wanted to leave, you had enough track record with him of trust so that he believed that you would do what you said you were going to do and he could envision a future with you without having to worry about your motivations. So you established your trust. Then you also realized that he was going to be a hell of a lot more motivated if he was an owner in the system, right? And so your answer to the problem of capitalism isn't exactly less capitalism. It's a much more distributed and generous form of capitalism that pulls everybody, the workers and the managers and owners, into the profit-making structure. Now you now the other advantage, this is so cool, eh? Because I've learned this as I've built enterprises too. If you make a really great deal with someone and the person's good and they're competent and they're honest and they're productive and they're generous, if you make a really good deal with them and you can let them go off on their own, that means that they're going to take care of a thousand details on their own keeping their own affairs in order that you don't have to take care of anymore. You don't have to micromanage. And that means that you can go off and, you know, expand your enterprise and do your own thing. And so the advantage you gain by distributing more responsibility, let's say to an extremely competent foreman, the advantage you gain is massive freedom. And you also gain the advantage of the fact that that foreman who now partakes in the enterprise is going to be much more motivated to make the enterprise work 
And so even if you end up paying him more, like a third of the company, let's say, or the profit share that you described, the overall profit is going to be so much greater that there's nothing in it but benefit for you and for him. And then you also pointed out, and this is a very crucial thing for people to understand, because this is where the left-wing critics of capitalism actually have a point, although it's not a problem that's specific to capitalism, which is that as an enterprise grows, and it doesn't matter what the enterprise is, the benefits tend to flow into the hands of fewer and fewer people. And that destabilizes the whole damn enterprise because you get too many slaves on the bottom and not enough pharaohs on the top. And that produces discontent and dissatisfaction and amotivation, and that can bring the whole damn system to a halt. So your, your solution to that was to set up this constitution that you described, which also enabled you to grow. I'm going to review it again because it's very, very important. This is the Economic Charter of Rights. So your management philosophy is to distribute responsibility and profit and to make that an explicit part of the agreement. And the deal is 20% of the profits go to the shareholders, 6% to the management, 10% to the workers, 2% to charity, 7% reinvested in um, research and further development. And you make that explicit. Now, the trust you described is also crucial because the workers with whom you're arranging to share the profits aren't going to trust that deal or go along with it if they think you're going to gerrymander the books on the profit side, right? They have to have to actually believe that you're going to play a straight game. But if you can explain to them that, well, you're going to play a straight game because if you motivate them properly, they're going to work a hell of a lot harder and everybody's going to make a lot more money and the products are going to have higher quality and we're going to sell more, then there's absolutely nothing there for people to, you know, steal selfishly and run away with. There's only the possibility that all that distributed responsibility and ability is going to produce more and more, well, it's going to be more and more productive and more and more generous. Now, I asked you when we met at the restaurant a couple of months ago, whether or not you had run into labor problems as you grew, because going from, you know, no employees to 100,000, you're obviously going to be dealing with potential labor issues. And you have said that as a consequence of this constitution and the trustworthiness of the process that you've had, that you've been able to pay your workers a premium rate, but that you've also had almost no labor trouble. Is that, is that correct? Have I got that right? Yeah, that's, that is correct. And uh, <clears throat> the interesting part about it is uh, we were basically in the automobile industry and the auto workers union was maybe the strongest union in America, right? Okay, so anyway, um, the president of the Canadian Auto Workers Union, his name was Buzz Hargrof, or still is, in, is his name. And I called him and I said, Buzz, let's have lunch. The two of us, we have an obligation. Uh, what are we going to do to maintain jobs and create new jobs? I said, let's have lunch. So we agreed, and then we sat down and said, Buzz, it shouldn't be that difficult to put on one page what's important for the workers and on one page what's important for business. And we call that a framework of economic justice. After a few weeks, we, we, we managed it a bit. We agreed on the thing, on, on, on that structure. He said to me, I, I might not get it through to my membership. Okay, and but he did get it through, and we we incorporated that. Huh? We took two factories where we said, "Look, we're gonna try and see how that works." Right. The part was our workers were very upset. They said, "Look, all of we we find we are happy. You want to change a total different thing here?" I took. I took a, I said, look, I have an, an application. We live in a society. We are a very important part of that society. We got to find ways and means. Can we learn from that, right? Because when I made my, you know, if you have a few hundred factors, when I made my rounds, I made it a habit always 
to uh, at least uh, every month I see maybe a new uh, a factory which I haven't seen for a while. When I made my rounds, I got the workers together and I said, look, those are the basic principles. But I said, let's make one thing clear. No government can guarantee your jobs. No union can guarantee your jobs. Not even Magna can guarantee your jobs. But I'm the head of the Magna. I can guarantee one thing, the basic principles. And that is, the very key I said is, if we, if labor and manage, management work together and make a quality product, that's the best guarantee. That's the best guarantee. And we can make the quality product if we, if we communicate and we put a very important uh, structure in, in our company, right? We audit the human capital. It's a very, it's a very unusual thing here. First of all, I put in a hotline. I had some trusted people and we got a big uh, notice on, and, and, uh, in, in the factories. If you're unhappy with something that's something discrimination, or unfairness, or women get best by a, whatever it is, call a hotline. But you don't have to give your name. And I had people then investigate, those were trusted people. And now when I would talk with managers, they said that's one of the best things you did. Because the first reaction when they did that, they said, the manager said, are you spying on us? They were unhappy. But now it's an other, because if you have an unhappy employee, unhappiness is contagious. If you got unhappy employees, there's no way you can make a quality product at a competitive price. So that's very, uh, so we've done that on a verbal thing where we have, and then we did actually an audit, uh, a written audit, a, 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 a human audit, where an employee got an envelope with no name on it, no, no, and they could take it home and fill it out, you know, various questions, is it safe, is it fair, discrimination, whatever, you could fill it out. And there's only one in, 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 in an envelope, no name on it, and you drop it in a, in a box and it's collected and then we analyze it and we could see right away if there was a problem. Okay. We could see it. So that is another worry, uh, because as a manager, let's say, uh, uh, the average factory was about 200 people an hour, an hour. And that's another very important thing to become. I always had efficiency experts come to me. Christ, you get over 400 factories, reduce it, you know, reduce it maybe to 20 or whatever. That means to have maybe, maybe five, 10,000 people per factory. People become a number. It doesn't work. It doesn't work, right? So we, Look, you should never forget the human side, right? By having smaller factories and we, let's say the factory is located more in the northerly region, it's run like a factory, right? If hunting season comes and some people want to take some time off, other people jump in. I say, like, I cover for you. I've worked the extra time. It's, it's, it's everything relates to people. The work has got to be an equal. And I said to myself, and I said to the managers, your number one thing is every day you got to work. Are you respected by the workers? That's your main aim. You got to be respected. And once when you built that thing, then you be productive, right? You be, they think of, the workers think of better ways to make things, right? And there, and business is easy. All you have to do is make a better product for a better price. That's as easy as it is. According to a recent report, Planned Parenthood continues to rake in billions despite dwindling clients. The biggest takeaway here is that Planned Parenthood is generating vast profits, including millions in taxpayer funding. 
With the help of Preborn, you and me, we are stealing their clientele, meaning the babies they are trying to kill. Preborn operates on a very slim budget as they rescue over 200 babies' lives every day and they receive no government funding. Preborn's network of clinics are situated in the darkest corners, competing head-to-head -head with the abortion giants. They need our help now more than ever. When you donate $28 to Preborn, you will offer a free ultrasound to an expectant mother caught in crisis. Once she hears that heartbeat and sees that precious life, her baby's chance at life doubles. If you would like to sponsor a precious baby's life, your gift will be tax deductible and will go directly towards saving babies' lives. Dial pound 250 and say the keyword baby or visit preborn.com slash Jordan. All gifts are tax deductible. You will never regret saving a child's life. That's pound 250 baby or visit preborn.com slash Jordan. So you pointed out there are a number of things that are extremely interesting. So one of them, you imagine that you're trying to differentiate your enterprise as it grows. You have 100,000 employees, and obviously there has to be a hierarchy between you and them. The question is, what size should the pieces of that hierarchy be? You know, there's an anthropological literature that relates cortical expansion, so brain size, to average group size in primate communities. And the optimized group size for human beings seems to be something around 200. What generally happens in hunter-gatherer societies is that if a society exceeds about 200 individuals, it'll break into two separate societies. That's very common. And I, I think the right. reason for that is, well, I think the reason for that is the one that you just pointed out, is that there's a, once a network of associations gets to be too big, you stop having that personal connection with people and you start to become a number. Like I've certainly seen this in educational institutions. You know, the huge universities reduce the university students to numbers. They're irrelevant. There's no personal relationship. And so the students end up feeling alienated and that demolishes their motivation. And, you know, in the typical educational apparatus in the higher education field, you have a 40% dropout in the first year. And that's obvious. That's a catastrophic figure. And I know a college, um, Hillsdale College, a small place, it's only got 1,200 people and it's hierarchically organized. They've managed to get their dropout rate down to 1%. So 40% is an absolute crime. Now you, how do you do, you talked about human audit. You also talked about allowing employees to put forward their concerns and, 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 and to indicate their unhappiness with process and to bring new ideas to the forefront without having to worry that they were going to be targeted for doing so. And that was very effective. So you set up communication networks in your factories and you kept them small so you could do that. How do you guys do in terms of employee wages, in terms of per capita employee productivity and with regard to turnover? Well, uh, first of all, I want to listen to you. There is in universities a uh, lecture course of what, what is the optimum uh, people uh, who are on the leadership, et cetera, and how many people are below or whatever. It's 200, right? So I should go back to school to maybe learn more about that. <laughs> so <laughs> that's but in, in, in practice, you, 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 you get to know it, it, you learn as you go along in practice, uh, and every business might be a little different, right? Okay. But in our thing, it, it, what I could see about a factory with 200 people, the manager had to again and practically know everybody by his first name. And how is, how is Billy, your son? How is he in, in football? It's, it's that kind of environment, right? A channel and not, not the phony one, right? Uh, uh, not, not a phony one because employees will realize if it's phony, you know, or if it's genuinely meant, right? That's very crucial, right? So, uh, so anyway, um, over the years, I gave a lot of lectures in universities. And I always start the, the students when they started out, the success of life can only be measured the degree of happiness you reach, you have. But I said, let me tell you from my experience, it's a lot easier to be happy if you got some monies. 
The smart students always have asked, well, how can we make some monies? So I said, look, if you be around 20 in your early 20s, you don't know yourself that well. Experiment a bit. Do something what you enjoy. When you enjoy something, you're going to be good in it. If you put in the extra effort, you could be one of the best, whatever it is. If you be one of the best, money is a byproduct. But I said, but one thing don't forget. You must not forget. Life has been great to you. Your parents sacrificed that you perhaps went to school. You have a right to use that knowledge, what you accumulated in school for your own benefits. But never forget, a portion of that wisdom, of that knowledge, got to go back to society for to a better society. But the very interesting thing is, it's only the last number of years I came to the conclusion that... Look, we have no faculties, right? They mean, as far as I, you know, as far as I can see universities, their mandate is to teach young people, can we have a more civilized society? Or be more specific, can we teach young people, can we as a university participate to develop a structure which could lead to an ideal society? That should be the main focus of a, of a university. Yes, we in the universities, we teach great medicine, great art, great sport, great technology, but we do not teach, you know, what is the structure of an ideal society. But it dawned on me in the United States about 70% of the universities are subsidized by private industry. And in Canada, 100% under the provincial jurisdiction. Okay, 100% subsidized. And management doesn't, doesn't want to bite the hand which feeds them. Okay, but uh, luckily I could uh, I could convince the minister of education uh, of, of of universities, Jill Roundtree, and uh, I think I'm doing a series in search of the ideal structure, which would lead to an ideal society. Your your workers, um, you've had little labor trouble formally. How do you know that your workers are in fact like? comparatively well paid in relationship to other enterprises of your type and how do you guys do in terms of retention and promotion well we have uh, we do constantly a survey the corporate constitution says the wages got to be average to the competition within the region and the profits uh, the profits in late town we had a formula it's not up to a manager to say I like that person or this or that uh, she's beautiful or, or whatever uh, it's we have a formula the formula was based on that, uh, based upon we wanted to reward loyalty and suppose you get a point for a year you've been with the company. Suppose you've been with the company five years, you get five points for loyalty. And suppose you get a point for every $5,000 you earn. And suppose you earn 50,000, you get 10 points for knowledge, right? And the more points you have, uh, the more you share out of the, out of the bot, right? But it's pre-formulated, right? So we want to, uh, we want to reward loyalty and performance. The managers are separate, right? They purely, uh, they purely participate, participate in their factory. I've always said there is no bad employees, only bad managers and the bad or there's very few bad managers. Or let me rephrase it. There's a few. Uh, there's some managers which need more learning experience, right? But there's very few bad managers. But there's no bad employees, okay? Because we, uh, it's our thing to, it's 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 our thing to assist them in in learning and what makes a factory run and I guess, I guess as a businessman, it's what makes the economy run in a country. 
the, the economy, we need a new model of the economy. And I, I, I think I, uh, Canada could be the first country with, uh, with an economic charter of rights. It, the, the economic charters of rights, it's fundamental. How many companies, okay, you've had a lot of success with this particular model of corporate governance, and it's allowed you to grow very rapidly, to, to develop a very large enterprise, and to maintain it across now quite a long time, because it's about 50 years, 70 years, 70 years. That's very long in the corporate world. How widespread have your ideas of constitutional profit sharing become? And what in your view, has been the impediment to their wider acceptance? Well, keep in mind, I was for many years on the corporate governance board of NASDAQ or the New York Stock Exchange, okay, where we take a look at uh, minority interest or, or the market not uh, behaving properly, right? And we worked at, we interfaced with the SEC Security Commission and, and brought forward that the market needs changing. Okay, there's no different in 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 here. It's it's a constant, and it should be done uh, within within the company, right? And uh, so it's expected that uh, management uh, lift to certain standards. Employees have to live in society. We have to teach standards. We have to. Uh, we we don't teach enough for our kids what it's all about, okay? And uh, I moved to, after I finished my schooling in Austria, I moved to Switzerland, right? Uh, and uh, I uh, it was a great learning experience. It's a great country with great people. It's made relative easy to 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 demand a referendum. Okay, and so on important things they have for referendums. In about two years, I, I think it was in the Wall Street Journal, Swiss, uh, Swiss people defeated the referendum to have more vacation. I think the referendum was to move the vacation up from three weeks to five weeks. The, the people defeated it and said, we cannot afford it. Right, right. It's the, it's the ultimate democracy. So why 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 have the ideas that you've put forward in relationship to the corporate constitution not been accepted and implemented by more companies, do you think? I mean, your model has shown that if you're more generous with the profit distribution, and if you formalize that distribution, you seem to gain an increment in productivity. And so why, also given the fact that, you know, capital tends to accrue in the hands of fewer and fewer people, why and that that's a problem for the maintenance of the popularity of the capitalist system in general, why do you think your economic model hasn't met with more acceptance? Is it just that it's too new? You know, I mean, new, new ideas take a long time to distribute. What's the impediment? Sure. I brought a book to Greed Factor, right? And homo sapiens are born with some greed. Without greed, homo sapiens cannot exist. And, uh, but greed after a certain thing, it's the most destructive for us. So, uh, it, it, like I said, I've pinned, uh, on the corporate governance board. It's what an education. We've made it too complicated for public companies, right? The paragraphs, like, I mean, it's, it's so complicated that, uh, um, uh, it's just not feasible anymore, right? So a young entrepreneur saying, ah, that's, it's, it's, and so everything is more complicated. So we got to get back again. And there was nothing wrong with Canada about, uh, about 40, 50, 60 years ago. Uh, so, uh, everything functioned quite well. So we have, we have gotten into that, uh, where we where we analyze where we where we look when you look at our uh, what to, the best the best way to to bring it across is when you take a look our our DAX code codex it's a thick book with thousands of paragraphs. Keep in mind when I fully run Magna, I had twenty lawyers on one side of my office and 20 financial experts just on the other side. 
When I went to the lawyers and said, I'd like to do XXX, is that within the law? Well, they said, that's within the law. I went to the thing here now, how is it treated from a tax point of view? After after a week, you know, you got the thing, it's so complete, it's so great, it could be the way. But they said, there's some, there's some experts down in the city, which, uh, so you gift, you, 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 you sent them the problem or the, the, the clarification. After a few weeks, they get a big bill and they say, can be either way. So everything, every, every paragraph, there's, there's thousands and thousands. They're more convoluted than the others. Until we have a, a DAX system, black and white, where everybody can fill out down, we have, how can a society function? The DAX system is, is landed in favor of, 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 of uh, specialized interest groups. That's the dilemma. Well, so you mentioned earlier in our conversation that you believe that it would be very difficult for you to start your, you know, dual garage basic factory today, that the regulatory burden would be just too high. And so, you know, as societies move forward in time, they tend to accrue more and more rules, right? They tend to stagnate themselves, and that's a constant danger. I mean, one of the advantages to the capitalist system is that large, unwieldy enterprises that no longer function get killed by the market and disappear. And we don't really have an equivalent function of death, let's say, in the bureaucratic realm. We have elections, but that doesn't really affect the bureaucratic state. Do you have any sense of how it might be possible to clear out some of the regulations that are impeding entrepreneurial development? And do you have you had any success in talking to politicians, let's say, in Canada, about how that some of that house cleaning might occur? The politicians can't do it. I, I could give you many reasons, or maybe some other times we have a little more time. But uh, and again, I want to point out no chainsaw approach. Uh, every It's not the fault of the bureaucrats. It's the fault of the system. But one be a civilized way would be not to rehire till they reach a certain status, right? And it's got to relate to the GDP, to, uh, you know, to the... To the, to the GDP, to uh, what we what we can create, it needs X. Same as a, a management needs X managers. The same uh, a society could have, where to it in, on the bureaucratic side, a certain percentage related to uh, to the market, to what does the country produce. Let's talk a little bit about the future now. One of the things we discussed when we first met was a new product that you're bringing to market. And um, on, on the cheap and easily accessible transportation side, especially for urban commuters, do you want to talk about the product that you guys are bringing to market soon and, and where you're going to build that and what your vision is for that? Yes. About two years ago, the premier called me and he said, I got a problem. I said, what? He said, Channel Motors is closing. You know the car industry. I got inducted in the American Automotive Hall of Fame in, in 2018. So I said, yeah, give me, give me a few days. Give me a week. I'll bring forward something. At around that time, I, I had to go down, down a few times. I should say the Magna Head office is in Aurora, which is about, um, uh, about 21 minutes down to the 401, right? Uh, so anyway, around that time, I had to go down, down a few times. What used to take me half an hour from the outer ring to the inner ring to Bay Street, now would take, if everything is fine, would take an hour, but it could take two hours. So I got stuck a few times, two hours, and I said, what a... What a waste of human energy. What a waste of, of non-renewable energies. But most of all, what a, what a, to inhale the carbon monoxide for two hours on the way in, two hours home. Uh, you know, I said, uh, what, what damage that does to, 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 to the, to the health, to, to the well-being of people. So anyway, I went back to the workbench. Okay. 
I should say uh, Magna is a major coffee manufacturing company. We have one factory where we produce all the Mini Coopers for the whole world. They keep, we shipped out of, out of our factories right under the showrooms, right across the world. We developed the Aston Martin to repeat, you know, right from our factory shipped to, shipped to the showrooms. A very unique car, no welding, no screwing. It, it was built like an airplane. It was glued together, right? But anyway, so I, 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 I think uh, I've, I've done that for 60 years. I came to the conclusion it's got to be a small electric car. I think we coined the phrase micromobility. And in loose terms, micromobility means you need, uh, you, you got to be able to park at least four of those in a regular car parking spot. To be more precise, if they cannot be wider than three and a half feet, not longer than seven feet, and you can plug it in in any electrical out, out, outlet, uh, one ten volt, and uh, in a few hours you can go a hundred kilom- kilometers with it for less than a dollar, or you can have a quick charging too. So it will change uh, transportation. Its main purpose is to get people from your home to your workplace and back home. We also done a, an equivalent uh, small pick, pickup truck, which will do inner city uh, merchandise delivery. And I should be in mass production about two, three months. Uh, the fact is just around we got the first prototypes coming off the line and it will change, uh, it will change, uh, transportation for many reasons. The primary reason is there's only so much oil in the grounds. The reason why gasoline prices are relative cheap is the United States is utilizing 120 million tons of grain to convert it into ethanol to keep the gasoline price down. You can't do that for long because the next wave will be, or the critical wave for society will be food shortages in the world. Not triggered by the Ukraine. It would have come anyway, but will be accelerated quicker by what goes on in the Ukraine, because the Ukraine is a major food producer. So, and the United States can't do that. So the gasoline prices will go up dramatically. I would say will double in two, three years. But most of all, I predicted eight years, gasoline will be rationalized, will only be available for essential purposes. One of the essential purposes will be electric trucks, uh, not electric, but me, uh, gasoline trucks will haul the food from the farms to the cities because the, the grip power will not be there for large electric trucks. Or you will not solve the traffic chains because there is the grid power isn't there. It would take much time to do it. You might have to go with small atomic powered stations, right? Uh, but that, but that's, that's another thing here, right? But the grid system isn't there at, uh, I built the first uh, hydrogen car with BMW about, uh, yeah, about 15 years ago. Yes, it works, but much more cumbersome, much more expensive. And I, I see a small electric car, uh, you know, uh, uh, that's the answer for now for the next uh, 50, 100 years. Do you want to talk a little bit about what it looks like and, 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 and what people can expect? What people can expect to see and experience when they when they use this particular vehicle? Okay, yeah, they're basically small, right? We again, its main purpose is to go from your home to your workplace and back home. Okay, and that means we have stifled uh, the the speed at thirty two kilometers per hour, right? So basically, the insurance be so minimal or practically none because you can't do any damage. Uh, so, and um, two people can sit in the car and uh, the people in the pickup truck, there's four people can sit in there. It could be a taxi. It could be, a, a, you know, merchandise delivery uh, vehicle. So, um, yeah, I, I think we, we have... Uh, 
We showed it on the Canadian Auto Show. We had the biggest lineups and thousands of people drove it. They got all enthusiastic about it. And um, the key question is, how do we got to get around? That's the key question. Right. It well, just, it looked like it looked like a kind of a hybrid between electric car and a, and a motorcycle, essentially. And the you mentioned as well, you know, that many families have a conundrum where because there are two people working and they tend to work in different locations that they need two vehicles. And one of the vehicles and both vehicles are very expensive and they're they're over-determined for the purpose. People need um, a commuter vehicle, essentially, as well as an ordinary vehicle to do all the other things they need to do with it. And your sense was that this vehicle would supply a low-cost alternative to people who need primarily need transportation to work and back and who wouldn't be using the vehicle who would be using their other vehicle for primary purposes other than that? Does that seem about right? Uh, a few changes. Uh, when I look when I look down the road, uh, now usually call it the middle class has a two car garage, two cars, right? Because um, the husband maybe went to work. In most some cases, the, the the wife do, but in many cases, the wife stayed home. She had kids, had to bring the kids to school or at the, the shopping, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So when I look down the road, I think I need a special permit for a large electric car for a family that you could go to the cottage or that for special purpose, not for daily commute, huh? Okay, and you have two or three. Uh, you can, and you could actually could get four small cars in there in a regular two car garage, and this is where cats or see their friends or where um, the wife or the husband go shopping. Uh, so you to run around, right? To to do things, meet up with your friends, and go to school or whatever. Go to work and. To, just uh, it's reliable transport at, at low cost and no, and no greenhouse gases. I would, I would like to thank you very much for the time you spent today. I, I very think it's very useful to explain to people. I think it's extremely useful to have explained to people. Uh, uh, Jordan, I don't want to flatter you. You are gifted to bring out the inner workings of of a lot of machinery, a lot of people. And that's, you know, as a technician, yes, I'd be able to trans reasonable well, but you have a gift to transmit it that it be easily understood by the people. So I'm delighted that I came. I'm delighted that I was invited. Well, it's it's so, um, what, what struck me in our conversations was the importance of disseminating your vision for fostering a generous productivity. You know, you created an enterprise that's distributed. You said that you've made millionaires out of many of your foremen, out of people who've rose to the position where they could run their own factories. You've given people the opportunity to have a tremendous amount of autonomy under your overarching authority and to bring out the best of them as they build their own factories and as they employ more and more people. And you've managed also to distribute that responsibility and opportunity all the way down to the workers. And, you know, it's absolutely obvious to me that there's never been a more effective machine for producing wealth than the free exchange capitalist system. The data on that are crystal clear. As soon as you stop countries from doing absolutely idiotic economic things and free up their population under a quasi-capitalist market, then everybody becomes richer. You Then you have the emergent problem of inequality, and that's a problem, but your system of distributed profits, given that it's honestly run, is a reasonable solution to that problem. And it's it's very good to hear you talk about how motivated you've been to build the company and and to produce all the products you have, but also how much you've been able to motivate other people while being productive and solving the problem of unequal distribution. So thank you very much for bringing that to everyone's attention. I, I got it. I got it. I had a few more words. My motivation was never to be hungry anymore and live in dignity. And the reason is it's very important. If a manager... Let's say a magnet manager wanted to make more money, he had to replace himself and has to open up 
another factory. So a manager could replace himself maybe 20, 30, or 50 times. And then he gets a cut from each factory where he made a contribution, a percentage of the profits. And this way, some of them, uh, their yearly income maybe was 5 million or 10 million. So the more they made, the more the shareholders made, the more the more workers made. So we, when I said it's so important that we have, that we have uh, smaller companies that um, young kids got to see, I want to be able to do like, like Joe Brown, I want to I wanna make 50 million or 100 million or, or like the football player, like the hockey player. We must give them the motivation, right? But let it be, right? Some people are quite happy with an XXX. Let it be, let everybody, I love the Beatles, their song, let it be, let it be, let everybody be, let everybody be, let everybody find their own way to happiness. Thank you. My pleasure, man. To everybody watching and listening, thank you very much for your time and attention. The film crew up here in Northern Ontario and uh, down where Frank is, thank you for the flawless technical, uh, the provision of flawless technical expertise on this front to the Daily Wire Plus for making these conversations possible. I'm going to continue talking to Mr. Frank Stronach for another half an hour on the Daily Wire Plus platform. Um, a bastion of free speech in an increasingly censorial world. And so if those of you who are watching and listening are inclined to devote your attention uh, to that platform, that would be much appreciated and maybe increasingly necessary as the months unfold. Um, I'm looking forward to coming and looking at your factory, Mr. Stronach. I think that would be very much fun. It's I, I love looking at industrial enterprises because, well, it's lovely to see that much concerted and harmonious effort working out to produce things that people actually need. I really wish you luck with your new vehicle. Um, I I hope that you've hit the market dead on and that people find this vehicle, you know, inexpensive, reliable and useful like many of your other products have been. And so that would be a lovely thing to see. It would be great to see that happening in Canada because uh, we lack a little entrepreneurial zing at the moment and that's, that's not as it should be. And so- I, I, I I didn't get in the most important message. What's my, uh, call my main aim is, my main aim is, I got uh, about 10, 15 years ago, he very heavily in the agriculture. The deeper I got in it, the more I could see this chemical jungle, you know, with all the pesticide and all the fungicide. So 95% of the food eaten comes from industrial farms. On industrial farms, you see no more eagles fly away. There's no more pheasants. There's no more rabbits. We spray everything with fungicide and pesticides. It gets in the air. We breathe it. Gets in water. We drink that. Gets in the soil. We eat the food. And all the kids' practice allergies and stage two diabetics is on the rise. So my main aim is my main goal is I don't I, every I don't want to see any Canadian kid to go to school hungry. That means practice. If it's got to be served. I don't want to see any Canadian kid to leave the school hungry. That means lunch has got to be served. And by law, it would the state, it has to be organic. I got every reasonable everything in, but there's lots more to where the public should know. Thank you. I enjoyed being with you. My pleasure, man. And uh, we'll we'll meet in a couple of minutes on the Daily Wire side and then again in the future. And thanks again, everybody, for for watching and listening today.